So before I start week three, I'm, I'm building. If you haven't noticed, there's a build. And I have one more week. Actually, I'll just heads up. I have one more week. And I've kind of sequenced these Midrash um, excursies out. So we can take a look at them and kind of get the foundation before we go to some more challenging ones and, and so on and so forth. But how has it been so far? Any thoughts? Is this new for anybody? Show of hands. And online as well, if you have thoughts, um, type it in on uh, Facebook or wherever. It'd be good to know uh, what you think online, because I think these are challenging and these can often be very, very difficult to explain to people quickly. So I'm thankful that we've had the time to kind of unpack this. So here we go. Week three. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to start off with one that's not so challenging, but it's a strange passage that doesn't really make a lot of sense unless you understand the Midrash. This might be one of those you read and then you just, you just kind of skip past it. Taking the kingdom by violence. Matthew 11, 10 to 15 reads, I'll tell you the truth. Among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, John the Immerser. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and violent people lay hold of it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John appeared. It's a really strange statement, right? The kingdom has suffered violence. I've seen a lot of explanations and I've not seen a lot of agreement on this passage. So we're going to build up to this. Um, but you notice the themes here. He's talking about the violence of the, um, attaining the kingdom. He's talking about John being somebody pivotal. And he's talking about the prophets in the law up to the point of John. Okay, so keep those in mind. The Midrash says the kingdom is taken by force. And previously, the prophets and the Torah were part of that, that um, arrangement, if you will. John is connected to the one to come. So Yeshua is speaking of John in a very consistent manner to a prophecy, which we will look at. Um, actually, I think it's Micah. I think I might have writ written Malachi. It should, I think it's Micah. Um, the breaker or the porets in Hebrew. It's, it's somebody who goes ahead of a flock, right? So picture a tiny rock, uh, a, a fence made of rock or whatever, and you have to get this entire herd through. The breaker in, in this midrash and from this prophecy is somebody who goes up and takes the wall down enough to allow more sheep to get through that wall. It's, it's a practical thing if you are in, in the Galilean hillsides and you... Um, her sheep. So Rashi confirms this concept in this prophecy we're going to look at, that it's talking about a savior. It's talking about somebody who goes ahead and breaks down the wall. There it is. Malachi, sorry. I said Malachi. I usually get those interchanged. Um, I will certainly gather you, Jacob. I will certainly assemble the Israelites who remain. I will bring them together like a sheep in a fold. So there's that imagery like a flock in the middle of a pasture. They will be so numerous that they will make a lot of noise. The one who makes a breach, the porets, the, the breaker, will lead them out. They enlarge it to a gate and leave by it. Their king marches on before them. So you get this idea. This, the sheep have to get through this gate. The breaker goes ahead. He's not necessarily the shepherd, but he's somebody very useful to the shepherd because he goes ahead and he makes that gate wider so the shepherd can do his job. Rashi says the breaker is their savior, in this sense, the one who breaks the fences, the thorns and hedges. And um, I replaced one of the words that said a wicket. I don't know what a wicket is. I just changed it out for it. Does anyone know what a wicket is? Okay. Um, I saw in, in cricket, there's a wicket. And I said, it can't be that. So I, I just made it easier. I took my own translation. But Rashi says this is connected to somebody who goes ahead and is doing some kind of a salvational um, act to make wider a gate. Okay, so we're getting closer. John is the person who did that. John is the person, according to Yeshua, using apparently the same Midrash Rashi is talking about to make wide the gate. Here's where we get closer to the mark on this particular Midrash. Eliyahu Rabbah is, is one of my favorite. It's a particularly Galilean set of Midrash. I've mentioned it before, but it has phrases and terminology and certain midrash that are very close to the New Testament because it's also Galilean. So that's a really interesting 
collection. If you're looking to start somewhere, you might have a hard time finding it, but Eliyahu Rabah is one of them. Amazing stuff in there. It's very tough. I found it on eBay. You translate it. I can show you the version I have. I don't know where else you would find it, though, because it's usually out of print. Or it's in Hebrew, not, not in English. Okay, so pour out pleas for mercy and entreat him with supplications and prayer and find a doorway into words of Torah. Among all the doorways that God opened for us through his servants, the prophets, the breaker has gone up before them the Lord at the head of them. So this Midrash is using the same connect, the same connection point that Yeshua is talking about for John. Here's where it gets good. A king said, I will test my sons and servants to find out who loves me and stands in awe of me. Whereupon he proceeded to build a courtyard four by four cubits wide, tiny. And its entrance, he made an opening four by four hand breaths wide. So very tiny, a little opening to get through that. And in it set a small window facing the open ground where people might come to pay their respects to the king. So the idea is people are in this cramped, tiny space, and there's a tiny little hole to get through. And if you get through there, you can pay your respects to the king, or you can take the option of sitting back from afar and just kind of seeing the king through the hole. This is the imagery that they're building. Then when his sons and his servants came and stationed themselves either in the courtyard or in the lane leading to it, the king was able to discern who loved him and who stood in awe of him and those who stood in all of him, but didn't love him as much. And here's where we get to the point. He who both loved and stood in all of the king suffered discomfort as he pressed his way through the small window, facing the open ground beyond to pay his respects to the king. So here's the idea of pressing, right? You had to press your way to get through that fence um, because apparently the breaker had not quite made that wide just yet. So in order to get to the king, in order to get to God, you had to press yourself. You had to really challenge yourself. It was very challenging, very difficult. Um, and I'll just skip this for the sake of time. He just kind of explains that prior to this, those who made it through were the, the authors of the books and the prophets. These are the people who teach Torah. Those are the people who went through the gate. So there's that theme that we saw in Yeshua's language. Well, if you look at this word in Matthew 11, violence in English, in some translations, is also press or pressing or forcing, right? So now, so it, just because of the way the English was rendered, we see violence. That's a very popular translation. It severs us from this Midrashic concept. So you can see how the translation is an interpretation, and we know that. But in this case, it, it completely removes from that Midrash that you can't easily get back to it. Here's a better way of looking at that. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven was achieved by force. Think of it, the forceful grasped it, the people who had to force their way through that tiny hole to get to God. But John made that wider through repentance. Do you see it? Does it make sense? Right? It's Yes. Yes, I did not get into that one on this one, but that is one interpretation that the kingdom of heaven, the prophets were killed by the Jewish people. And that's what that statement of Yeshua is teaching, which of course is. I would, I would say that's a very good theory because it's interpreting what this passage seems to say to someone who's severed from that, that worldview and this particular Midrash. Yeah, that is, and, and a lot of these have that. A lot of these have an anti-Semitic bend to them over the centuries, but we know that's anachronistic because this wasn't an argument at the time for centuries, as we know. Right. So, okay, there we go. We're starting off, but that's an example of one. It's not such a shock to our pet theologies, but you can see how 
these things exist. Hopefully by this time you're seeing that these things exist all throughout the New Testament. And if you stumble across them, you, you will have to re- completely reframe how you read. Right. And, and what you're seeing is a very different interpretation. Now we're finding that John made access to God easier, not narrow. He made it easier. And, right. Which is, whoa, that's a whole different interpretation. That's what he meant. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Um, we covered this. I'm going to move ahead because I have some other good ones I want to get to. On this rock. This is a good one. Um, very famous passage. I grew up in the Catholic Church. For, for many years, so I'm familiar with this particular passage. Uh, Yeshua says, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the foundation of the Catholic idea of papacy, and pretty much whatever comes with that. Um, Father Emmanuel Clapsis says, Classic Roman Catholic tradition maintained that the universal primacy of the Bishop of Rome, Peter, was divinely instituted by Jesus. This was derived from Peter's text in the Gospel accounts of Matthew. Um, According to the Roman tradition, they all refer not simply to the historical Peter, but to every successor after him in that line. So they hold Peter on a very high level because of that passage, which means there's your proof, according to the Catholic Church, for a papacy. And whatever happens in, under the papacy is good to go because they're in that same line. We have a little bit of a problem with that, I think. It's okay if you don't. Um, but we have to go back and look at what did that mean at that time. So the word for rock, um, it's a Greek loan word. There are many of these. You'll see it in Aramaic and in, in the Hebrew. There are words that were borrowed from the Greek. And Peter might have something to add to that. But these words appear and they're Greek wor- it's a Greek word, but it's... It's now here in Hebraic form or Aramaic form. And Petros replaced the word tsur in the Septuagint. It was a, it, tsur lost its popularity for some reason or another, and Petros became a more commonly used word. You'll see it in some of the Midrash um, in the Hebrew, of course. It was used as a name. There's another um, rabbi, Rabbi Yose ben Petros, son of the rock or however you want to read that, in the Jerusalem Talmud and also in the Midrash. So we're seeing not just Peter, other people had this name. So it it has effectively become a word, a colloquial word in the rabbinic um, language. And it appears in a Midrash. Matthew, just going back in here, it's a play on words that Yeshua says, and I'm sure we've, we've all heard that at some point. Right. Right. When it was when it was given, it, it was it was like when people said, "From this city, you could see Safat in the distance, the distance you know, from the hills of Galilee." Yeah. So without that understanding of the setting they were standing in, you could derive all sorts of things. It was, it was also at the foot of Mount Hermon, and there was a cave there that was known as the Gates of Hell. Yep. That's what I'm talking about. That's right. It's yeah. It, 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 yeah, yeah, Mount Hermon, yeah, the, the cave, all the pen, it was all part of that picture. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I didn't take that route on this one. That's the crux of the historical and even the evangelical argument against the, the Catholic Church. They say, no, he's not talking about Peter. They're, they're talking about the rock and this location. And that would bring in demonology. And a lot, But that's another critical point to understanding this because it's contextual. They were in that place. But what you're seeing is a play on words. You are Petros. And on this Petra, he'll build a foundation. 
um, the congregation, or if you will, church is what we saw earlier, but this is what we're looking at. These two words, it's a play on words. It's brilliant, actually. Exodus Rabbah gives us a little bit more insight to what he's talking about. The Holy One was seeking to secure a strong foundation for the world, and he could not find a way to do so until the patriarchs arose. He looked at the world in this midrash, and he sees everyone's involved in idolatry and um, licentiousness, just evil stuff. And there's really no one I can, I can build my kingdom on. This is likened to a parable. And there are many versions of this, by the way, but this is the one I chose for now. A king came to lay the foundation for a city. In another place, um, but, but once the rising water overturned the soil, there's the flood, right? He had to get the people out because of a flood. Um, this continued until the king arrived in another place where he found a great rock. And he said, here on these rocks, I'm going to establish my city. From the top of the rocks, I see him is where they get this idea from in numbers. There's a king who desired to lay and build a foundation. He dug constantly deeper, but found only swamp. At least he found um, and dug a rock, a Petra. So in this particular Midrash, it says Petra. So we're seeing the same word. On this spot, I shall lay my foundation. Now, he continues to talk about the, the generations before, but it was on Abraham. He, when he finally saw Abraham, he said, behold, I found a rock, a Petra, upon which to build and lay my foundation. And this Midrash also talks about the cornerstone, the temple, the, I'm sorry, the tabernacle. So the, no, I thought it was right the first time. The temple, th that rock is that foundation for the temple. It's in the Midrash, God is trying to find a people group or, or even a person from which to build his kingdom on this earth. It's, I have this great thing, but I have to have a solid ground to put it on. And from this tradition, it says at the bottom, Therefore, we call it a Avraham rock, as it is said, look to the rock from which you were hewn. And Israel, he called rocks. So God's righteous people, the patriarchs, those of Israel are known as rocks. And this is all throughout the New Testament. It's not just in the verse we, we saw with Peter. But the emphasis is not on the person, the emphasis on what he wants to build on the righteous people. Go ahead, Jake. God can take up one of these rocks and Yes, I have that. I have that coming up. <clears throat> so you see right now we have the same thing. We have we have somebody saying they want to build this great thing. I have it here. I just need to find a place to put it. And he, Yeshua gives us a, a geographical point of reference, which has a lot of meaning at that time. And he explains that this is um, not given to you by man. This is something that as in that, that uh, discussion, it's given from above. This is something that's, that transcends earth here. But so it's interesting, I'm going to move on from this. In this Midrash, Yahud, it says Petra. It's the same word. Um, it actually has the, the, the Greek into the Hebrew form there, which is pretty, pretty good connection, right? I mean, it's, it's the same word. Okay, so here we are. The rock represents the patriarchs of Israel, the righteous among the nation of Israel, the, who are going to be the foundation for God's kingdom, for this teaching, this knowledge, this kingdom of priests, right? Um, this alludes to the temple and the Midrash specifically. And again, as I go on, the purpose of the rock, the person, whatever you want to call the rock in this case, it's the, the uh, patriarchs, is to support and uphold the work of God. It's not to create a whole new thing. We're not creating a whole new system here. That's not what the Midrash is saying, and it doesn't seem to be what Yeshua is saying. And here's the verse Drake mentioned. Um, when he saw the Pharisees, this is John, coming to his immersion, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, produce fruit that proves your repentance, and don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children for Abraham from these stones. Same concept. John is using the same Midrashic concept that Yeshua is using later. And you can see how these all weave together. And there are many more passages in, in this vein in the Gospels and in the New Testament. Make sense? Uh, I think the tradition is that God destroyed his house rather than the people when, he, when the temple was destroyed. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, not one stone will be left upon another, but God defers to the actual stones being torn rather than destroying utterly his people, yeah. which shows great love. And I think there is a New Testament tradition also that um, individually we are blocks building a temple 
That's right. When we don't have a temple yet, but we can be rocks. Like it, it's a little bit more of an individual uh, pushing. Like, yeah. you're not just a passive participant here. You have, somebody's going to use you. Right. Wonderful. So if you think yeah. back to the, uh, the alternative presentation I gave you in the beginning of this, that says that that person is the person we have to outsource all of our religious fealty and, and um, they'll be the one who does it, right? The Pope. Whereas we're saying or from this, we have to be that foundation. And this Midrash also connects with Psalm 113 um, and some other of the Midrash, the Hallel Psalms, the, the cornerstone, the, 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 the rock, the builders rejected. It's the same theme. It's the same concept that we're seeing th throughout this New Testament. And it's 100% in line with Midrash Rabbah. I love all the rocks and stone. Right? Of course, in, in Hebrew, there's multiple words for that. So there's the Evan and there's a Tor. But the, the idea is basically the same. And so laying off of the Psalms, the Hallel Psalms, the rock, the rock built is rejected. I love the Isaiah reference that you gave. You know, the rock from which it was given, which I think is beautiful straight there from Midrash. I got a new title for you. Up the old <laughs> <laughs> I, like I didn't spend a lot of time on the title, so I'm going to have to <laughs> refine this. <laughs> I'm going to take that. Well, good. Um, okay, here's another one. I just I think one more on this one, and I'll move on. <clears throat> As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you, like yourselves, are living stones being built up as a spiritual house, a temple to be a holy priesthood. So again, we're seeing the same idea. And then it, this is the cornerstone passage, but it's everywhere. Now that you've seen it, not every time you see the word for stone or rock, but a lot of times. Um, and you could almost, it's 100% fair to take Yeshua's words about the stones being taken one off of the other. Not a single stone will be standing on it. You could look at that as the leadership too, right? You could look at that as a dismantling of a structure. It's totally in bounds. You can do that. But what I think we, we're saying we can't do is read this out of context and create an entirely new structure and um, think that that will be pulled from the words of Yeshua and the Gospels. So that's what I'm, it's a fascinating one. Okay. This one, this one is one of my favorite ones because who hasn't had this question before? <clears throat> the Torah is passing away. The covenants are passing away, right? Who... Has everyone at some point had to wrestle with this? I'm sure you did. Hebrews 8.13. Um, now in saying something new, he has made the former old, but that which decays and grows old is close to passing away. Have you heard that in some form? Has someone said that to you and you've had to? Yes. Yes. After dinner, me and my guests sat down and talked exactly about that passage right there. Can I ask the question you asked me? What about? Yeah. Well, hopefully this is helpful. You can give them the uh, playback. This, for, for one, it's Hebrews. So we already know the audience. This is one of the books that pretty much tells you the audience. What it doesn't tell you is that you have to be very versed in the Midrash as a default. And you have to be very versed in the mystical cosmology of, of what the temple represents and what earth and this age represent. And I'll show you what I'm talking about very briefly. <clears throat> but once you get these pieces correct and you look at the Midrash, all of Hebrews makes sense. And if you read it this weekend while it's fresh on your mind, it'll radically change this book for you. Okay. Um, since you already answered that, we'll move past. People effectively say the Torah and the covenants are obsolete. All you people doing Jewishy things, that's you're wasting your time. I didn't bother quoting some of the favorite sites I go to just to kind of get a wrong interpretation because it's just so prevalent. Everywhere you go, got questions, um, every commentary, they all come to the same conclusion. And it sounds really good, but it's just missing something. Yeshua and Paul said the opposite. So apart from that, um, we have a problem. Okay. Here's what we need to know. Hebrews, the book, uh, the, the, the letter, Leverage is a well-known midrash about the enduring nature of the thanksgiving offerings and the peace offerings after the Messianic age is in instituted. Two, the author assumes this Jewish audience knows about that and the two major ages of which we are going to focus on, 
Olam Haze, this current age or this world, or Olam Haba, the world that's coming or the present, the, the, the age to come. However, you want to look at that. And it, Hebrews is very deep, by the way. There are very deep mystical concepts <clears throat> around the world, the, the idea of worlds, and how everything physical was created from the invisible, the uh, esoteric. And I have an entire two, three weeks on that alone, but know this for now. You need to know that Olamot, worlds, ages, represent something that's not um, a random word that they use here. It has actually, it's packed with meaning. And they believe that the Olam Haze, the present age, was ending any minute. And that the Olam Haba, started off by the Messianic Kingdom, was pretty much at hand. And things are going to change. And Yeshua says this, if you think about it. We covered this, I think, in week one. Not until heaven and earth pass away does anything change in the Torah. At that point, it's speculated. Something will change. What changes? We don't know. Nobody has seen that. But something will change. Um, but until then, until we get to that point, nothing changes. right? And third, um, and that's what I'm saying here. Shul and Yeshua both speak to the enduring nature of the covenant and the Torah. The promises are still out there to be fulfilled. We still have the Gila, the redemption ahead of us. We, we're not there yet, right? Here's what we need to know. Okay, <clears throat> the present age are the 6,000 years, according to this Midrash, that we're in now. We're still within that frame. We're very close to the end by that calendar. But nonetheless, there's the present age. Then there's the Messianic age, which is the beginning of the events that move us into that world to come where that um, spiritual and physical reality are merged. We don't know what that looks like. Hebrews is very specific, though. The temple offerings, etc., as it goes on in Hebrews 9, which are symbolic for the present age. So they're, they're making a distinction between what's going on in the present age. Um, and it talks about Yeshua and the need to understand the change that's coming. But as he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So they're very much talking about, and there are more passages like these. I just grabbed a few that fit. They're very clear when they're talking about this one or that one. When it's talking about the age to come, it says he did not put the world to come about which we are speaking in charge of the angels, right? He's making a distinction. I say he, I'm sorry. I always think it's he for some reason. It's a bias maybe. Um, I'm sorry. If it's Phoebe, I'm totally sorry. But we don't know who the author is. But they say in this particular line, we're talking about the world to come here. We're not talking about what we've been talking about up to now, which is the present age, we're now talking about the world to come. And that's where it gets into more of the esoteric, mystical um, understanding that you, you basically have to have an idea of to know what they're, why there's a difference between these two. This is physicality as we know it, um, duality, evil, good, sin. This era, all of that's been done away with and now we're in some new territory. And that's what Hebrews is talking about except for they think that that is happening right there in their time. Um, they believe that that's what was coming. And then Hebrews 6, 3 through 5, and this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of God's word and the powers of the age to come. So apparently people were sampling and, and experiencing some of what's coming in the world to come in their time though. But it's very clear that they're talking about two different ages. They're not saying... Um, categorically that Torah is done, in a way, done away with. I always thought it was interesting that in reference to the age to come, and I'm sure there's a bunch of really good reasons for it, um, that we don't have any prophecy or prophetic uh, you know, tangibles about that age. We don't know anything about it. I used to think to myself, well, we don't need it because we're we're no longer in sin anymore, for one thing. I mean, the prophets were given to us to, to help us with um, the problem that we're in and with the enemy um, and, and to give us hope and a light and a guide. We don't need that from that point on, number one. Another thing that I thought about is that, you know, the enemy also uses information of the prophets. They're not... Um, they're not ignorant to the information of the Bible. They use it very much to get the very most they can out of this age that we're in now, knowing that 
it's going to be the um, the essence, if you will, of, of their life. You know, if if they've committed to that, they're not going to be a part of that each to come. So, and you said something which is very common. It's the understanding that this is what one of the translations said. Now the Torah is written on our hearts and we're no longer a slave to sin. Well, that's not, in my opinion, that's not true. We have, we have a big problem with that today. What's more problematic is thinking that you can't sin today and you absolutely have work to do. Linda, like we were saying, there is work to be done. We have, we have to remain in that stone. Uh, it, it, there's a good reason why we're not told a lot of information about the age to come and things like that. Because honestly, we don't really need it. We, as a people, have a tendency to zero in on focus on things that we do not need to focus on. And so what we need to focus to get to the age to come yeah. is living good lives here yeah. and now. Right. Because that's what keeps us on the train, moving in the right direction. So we, need, we don't need to be future focused. We need to be present focused. Future will come whether we like it or not. Yeah. It's really not, not in our hands, but we need to make sure we get there in one piece. Yeah, and the sages say that, that we don't have any prophecies of that time. Everything prophesied is for the Messianic era. So no eye has seen that this part over. This is where all the prophecies are pointing to the Messianic age, which is a transition phase. Because we have work to do, but if, you, if you're under the belief that, that um, you know, it's passed away already, and a lot of translations will, will bend the, the tense here to say that it has passed away, then you're in trouble because you don't know that the race is still going and you've, you're still at the water table, right? Like you've pulled over and you don't realize, like, no, the time is still going. Okay, so we got that clear though, right? Present age, something comes and changes, a renewal, and then the world to come. Okay, well, this is good because it aligns with the sages and it aligns perfectly with uh, Leviticus Rabbah. Um, the rabbi is saying the time to come, the Messianic era, all sacrifices will be annulled, but the sacrifice of thanksgiving will not be annulled. Why? Because basically there's no need for sin anymore. That's been taken care of, right? We don't have that in the world to come. We've been rectified. And they use the same passages from Jeremiah that Hebrews uses. Same exact passages. Um, voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the groom and the voice of the, the bride. And they say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts. This is a prayer of gratitude. So they're, it's no wonder Hebrews and Leviticus Rabbah are using the same prophet. And that's where we're seeing this con continuation of this idea. So the rabbis agree, something will change in the Messianic era and, and onward. Um, Maimonides says, <clears throat> specifically, in Malachi, it says the offering of the minchat will be pleasing to God, not a sacrifice, but a different, um, an, an offering, a peace offering, you know, the afternoon. It's, a, it's an entirely different structure. It's not a sin offering. It's not atonement. So in there, they get the idea, and of course, he quotes the same Midrash again, that that's a sign that in the future, there will be some kind of offerings, but it won't be the kind necessary for when we transgress because we're not going to have that problem. So they agree. Something changes in that time, provided we're in that time. So the argument then becomes, are we in the Messianic era now or not? And that's where we have to make a decision. I'm not going to ask that question right now. All right, so the Torah... Yeah. <laughs> Is the Torah passing away? No. According to the rabbis, perhaps only the, and again, this, these are all speculative. This is rabbinic um, play. Maybe they say the sacrifices and atonements for sins will be no more. Edric. Um, I think the, the way I've always learned that was um, that sacrifice as an institution, perhaps with the exception of uh, Shlomim offerings, would be annulled after the Messianic age and in the world to come. Uh, that, like in Ezekiel, it talks about there being a sacrificial system, like, like uh, a levy is, is, to, is to remain pure, you know, a, a, a religious functionaries are not to marry prostitutes and things like that. And so the, they're speaking of the third temple in Ezekiel, and they're speaking of all these broke functions and ritual purity as still part of the Messianic eon, because it assumes that there's 
sin and the ability to mess up and, and all these different things. Um, but I, the, the mark that I've always heard is that they put that at the world to come. You know, so I guess that might be a, maybe it's a dispute. I don't know. Well, so that's a really good point. The Messianic era, there's a lot of discussion about that. Some say nothing will change at all. It'll be normal. Some say it'll be incredibly different. The world we know will completely change. I think some say, well, it'll start off no change and it'll gradually move towards. Okay, we're talking in their ideas a thousand years. But no one has ever said that the entire thing is dismissed, all the covenants, right? I think they can have fun kind of figuring out what what that era looks like, but it's all speculation. And we, and we were doing Purim. You saw the discussion there. Some of the holidays are going to stay. Which one's Purim? All the other ones are going away. Why? And they have reasons for this. It's just they're having fun with it. Um, they're kind of dreaming into the future. What does it look like? What stays normal and what goes? And what's important today if we believe that it's going to be important then, right? It's kind of a frame for what do we do today, to Peter's point. But Hebrews, now that you know, we're talking about two different ages, <clears throat> and they are also saying what the sages say. Now you have enough to go back through Hebrews, and it'll never read the same way again. It, you'll see it's 100% in line, and it's actually very, very deep. Um, but it's not at any point saying that the Torah and the covenants are gone, because if that's true, we have everyone has big problems. Then what are we doing here? <clears throat> okay, I think I have time for one more. What do we go to here now on the clock, Peter? 15 after? Okay, thank you. All right, a portion of the dough. This is another one that has a um, an outcome if you read it a certain way. Okay, so Romans, if the dough offered as a first portion is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So we get this idea that if this little section is holy, so is the whole lump. Now, I don't know that everyone understands that in its Jewish, um, in a halakhic sense. I think they look at it as there, there's this common mundane mass of something and you take this little bit off and that's holy and only that part is holy and the rest of it's just whatever, right? That's not what they're saying here, actually. Right, um, hafrashis hala, we'll have that in here. If you look at this, <clears throat> right out of the Torah, we get the, idea that we have to set something aside as a gift to God. And in the case of a, a, the teruma, a particular offering, it doesn't really matter. There's not a specific size most of the time of how much you're taking off of it. You're just pinching off a piece of the dough or whatever it is that you decide to set aside. But you take some aside as the first yield of your baking, you shall set aside a loaf as a gift. So we kind of have to get into the Torah and understand what the offerings in this case are and how they work. The word teruma, which is what they're talking, which is what Paul's talking about in shorthand, comes from the word room to lift up or to elevate. That's important. You got to keep that in mind as we move forward. There are two types, two general types, redemption of the firstborn. And we talk about that every day <clears throat> during the week and tithes. So grain, challah, gifts, and produce. You could basically say, I'm going to give 2% of this today or just take a little bit off and you you give it over. Now, specifically, one of the more famous, well-known and more observed is, is for bread. Um, this is what Brad was talking about. Jewish law requires that a portion of dough or finished baked product be set aside for what's known as challah. While any size portion is adequate, it's customary to separate a portion the size of an olive. And often in Orthodox families, a friend of mine I spoke with, he says it's his one of his wife's favorite mitzvot. She'll put it in the oven and just let it burn off. But it's going back to numbers. It's remembering that this was a commandment given. Paul is assuming um, his audience, even though they may entirely be Gentiles, they understand this because of proximity to the community that they're part of. Because there was a temple back then. They, they would still have to honor this in some sense. Okay, so keep that in mind. This is where we find a matching Midrash, Exodus Rabbah 15.6. Our forefathers were the Teruma of the Holy One. Blessed is he, as it is stated, Israel is holy to Hashem, the first of his crop. So the rabbis say that you have the entire world. God takes a, a very tiny piece of that, that population off and he makes them his Teruma. Now, good for them, right? What about everybody else, right? So great for them. What does that matter for everybody else? This is where we get it wrong. T 
typically people look at it only the, the part that has been made holy to God is valuable and the rest just goes wherever, right? That's right. Is that, have you heard that before? It's, it's like you have a very tiny, small circle and those are the important people and everyone else is, is um, insert your conclusion, right? Okay. So the commentary on Exodus for boss is the comparison between the Terumah and the Jewish people. Before Terumah is taken from a batch of produce, the produce is a mixture of holy and profane. And for that reason, it's for, forbidden for consumption. When the owner, though, designates a specific portion and separates it, he rectifies the rest of it and makes it suitable for eating. So because of that tiny little bit that was given over to God um, in holiness, separate, set apart, the rest of it is now made fit. Okay, so I want you to think of the implications of this because you'll see this same concept in various portions of the Gospels. And again, it's, it's one of those moments where it's a, it's a widening of the gate. It's not a narrowing of the gate. Um, the Tanya, so I, I tried to stay in the Midrash. I had to go here because they do have a really amazing explanation of what this means on a spiritual level. And a lot of the Tanya is very much in line with the New Testament. Um, just speaking much later. And even though he distributes no more than a fifth part, this fifth part carries the other four parts up to God with it to provide a dwelling for him. So we're seeing lifting up, elevating, and through the sacrifice of an animal. So now the Alter Rebbe is talking about the all the sacrifices. What do we do them for? Just to um, feed, the, feed the priests, right? Is that written? No, there's more to it. The sacrifice of an animal elevates the others. Um, uh, thing, all living things were elevated to God through the offering of one animal. All plants through that of one tenth of a fine meal with oil and so on and so on. So there's an idea that Paul is, is talking about because this, this one group of people, and in my read of what Paul's saying, he's not talking about the Messianic Jewish believers. He's talking about the greater Jewish population who are holy to God. They're they have the prophets, they have the Torah, they're following the commandments, they're seeking God. Because of them, the audience he's speaking to is now allowed to be part of this. Go ahead. Yeshua as the ideal Israelite, as the, the son, in the same vein as Israel is the son, when he said, if I be lifted up, if I be elevated, I will draw all men unto myself. So I think that's the same yes. concept. Yeah. Yes, and you said it, not me. Um, that is a very, that is a very good read of that, in my opinion. I think what we're seeing is Yeshua becomes almost like the Rebbe for the rest of the world who didn't have a Rebbe, and he he creates an opening for the greater Gentile world where they had none. They had no other opening at that time. The nations will come and say, "Our fathers had nothing but lies." Right, and we've looked at Midrash in the past weeks where those people came to God under Sarah and they were turning away from idolatry because, not because they, they did the, oh, I don't want to be rude, not because they believed a certain doctrine and believed it a certain way that was the right way and all the other ways are wrong, but because somebody made an opening, somebody opened the gate and because that, this is where we get that wrong, that tiny piece that was broken off and made holy to God is opening and elevating everything else. It's a complete opposite. In the season of the Omer right now, and I want you to think about what, what this is all about. The ritual of the Omer is to go into the field and take one sheep from all the fields of Israel, one sheep, okay, and to gather that and to make one, you know, a loaf out of it and offer it to God. And what, how do they offer it? As an elevation offering, okay? And that's how the first fruits are brought. And to think about it, the whole what we're celebrating right now, what we're looking at, is the first fruits offering. But then the whole entire harvest is sanctified because a priest took a little part and shook it before God and said, "Okay, Lord, here it is. Thank you. Look, this is this is the fruit that we have gathered. This is the proof that you're good. That you sent rain and sun and gave an increase, and now we can eat. And so, as that offering has been brought, now the harvest is actually edible." Because you're not allowed to eat off of that new crop until proper thanks have been given for the harvest. So the entire harvest, all the fields of Israel, are now be called holy because one sheep is brought to the temple. 
Yeah, I was reading something recently about um, two contra seemingly contradictory verses in the Psalms, one of which says that the earth belongs to the Lord, but then another verse says that he has given it to the children of men. So which is it? Is it God's or is it man's? And um, that in a sense, whenever we recite a blessing over you know, whatever food we're about to eat, that we acknowledge it was God's and he gave to us and we redeem it by doing that. And I wanted to just maybe the, along the same lines, by elevating the one, it redeems the rest. <coughs> Yeah, that's, that, that's a good connection to me. Um, and building on what Peter said, just another extreme to that is the 70 offerings on Sukkot. Those are for the nations. But but wait, they didn't believe this, this, and this. Nowhere Middle East. Right. The nation of priests. The nation of priests. And that's, the nation of priests is what that Midrash is talking about. And Paul is tapping into what was already common knowledge and leveraging that same midrash to say something to, again, the point of Linda, that you need to be that holy people for the sake of the world. We don't just wait for one person to come and, and do that for us. We have to be those people. And that goes back to Abraham arguing, trying to find, what is it, five good people to save all of Sodom and Gomorrah. But the, the onus is on us. We have to be that teruma. We have to be that part set apart for Shem. It is not, hey, good, we're good, they're all going to burn. Right? It's the complete opposite. Right. And there, unfortunately, there's a lot of that out there. All right. Um, oh, right on time. So the teruma of the world, it's a small portion that elevates the rest, provided it remains teruma in, in the case of how we live our lives. So too, the work of the righteous can elevate the rest of creation. And that is how we read that passage in Romans. And that's it. I have more I'll bring next week.